Simon, we are playing this interview because you have passed away. It's an mm. incredibly sad day. Um, we recorded this so you are able to pass on some of the things you've learnt recently, some of the things you've learnt in life. And again, another victim to cancer. You had yeah. no idea. I had no idea. And like most people, I thought if you led a healthy life, I didn't smoke. I had a few glasses of wine, but my alcohol drinking habits were negligible. You went to the gym? I was very fit for my age, extremely mm. fit. And I thought was a good marker was throughout my life, I'd never had so much as a bout of flu. Never had a flu injection, would you believe? Right. Never caught flu. When I started, when I first became uncomfortable, I'll go through the symptoms in a moment, yeah. um, with my stomach, um, I took some paracetamol. And I said to the f pharmacist, um, are people you know, allergic to uh, paracetamol? Mm. He said, well, you're not, sir, otherwise you'd know about it. And I said, how would I know about it? He said, well, pre I presume you've taken paracetamol in your life. <laughs> you I hadn't. said, no, I haven't. You've never even taken paracetamol? No, I've never taken any sort of painkilling. But this uh, is, is worrying no. because you're fit, you go to the gym, you eat properly, you exercise. Yeah. And you get pancreatic cancer. cancer. Um, and So how? And the speed with which it, uh, it arrived. I mean, if I, we're now speaking in February 2020. Mm. If I took you back to the beginning of December 2019, a couple of months ago, just over, I had no symptoms at all. I was carrying on my life as normal. And the first I noticed was I was watching I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. You like to watch that, right? Well, I enjoy it, yeah. yeah. And I noticed during that series, that's the sort of time, nine o'clock, when I had my evening meal, I was beginning to go off my food a little bit. Right. And I thought, this is a bit strange. Mm. The sort of things I enjoyed, things like my favourite dish has always been roast chicken and roast potatoes and greens, which I cook for myself regularly because I used to love it. Mm. And then I would, with the, um, the remains of the chicken, I would one night, I would carry it, etc., etc. And then I'd have cold chicken and chips. So I made a, mostly a full week of one right. chicken and I enjoyed it. Yeah. And I had my chicken meal, got through it. And that's, and the chicken stayed in the fridge for the next the rest of the week. Because all the things I then enjoyed doing, like currying it, I didn't really fancy it. Right. And I thought, this is strange. Yeah. Anyway, once again, I started buying other things to eat, thinking perhaps it's time to vary my diet because I've never been a great chef. Well, I've never been a chef. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm hopeless at cooking. Yeah. So um, I varied my diet a little bit. And once again, you carry on. And about two weeks later, and I'm now talking about mid-December, I woke up in the middle of the night, first sign I had, I had a tummy ache right. across the top of my tummy. So what, like a muscle pain or a, like a tummy possibly ache. ulcery or something? Well, somebody suggested when I mentioned this, uh, they said you might have an ulcer, Simon. Right. I, don't, I don't know how I could have got an ulcer, but it, may, it could have been an ulcer. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was disquieted enough to visit the doctor. Now, that was the next problem I had, of course, is because I didn't have a doctor. Right. I mean, I had one when I was living up here in Ipswich. Yeah. But since I moved to London... You never needed one. Never needed one. So um, I had to search around and I went to a local practice. Of course, these days you, you don't get a, a doctor to yourself. You have to yeah. take whoever, whoever's there. And he said to me, um, I've also had a little bit of a hernia, which I developed in 2011. And I went into um, hospital in Ipswich 
and uh, they got some paperwork mixed up and they thought I had gallstones. Right. <laughs> anyway, that put me off completely. So I, yeah. I never actually had it attended to. And and one of the doctors said, look, if it's not causing any problems, you, you just leave it. No big deal. So um, mm. I thought it may be that. And then the doctor said, well, look, what we'll do, we're now talking about you know, mid-December 2019, we'll take a blood test. And I, a text came through, your blood's all right, blah, blah, blah. And then a second one came through a couple of days later, your gamma reading is high. I never heard of gamma reading. Right. On my, on my blood. So they said, come back in for a further blood test. Well, when I went back in and had another blood test, the gamma reading had doubled. Right. Um, so, then, so what actually is the gamma reading? What I no idea. It's, it obviously registers something right. in the blood that there, there's some something going on inside. In right. fact, they were the words he used. Um, so, well, there's something going on inside you which we need further looking at. Yeah. Because um, th that your reading, if you look, and he looked, and my gamma reading was 16. Last time I had a blood test, they had my records from Ipswich. Yeah. It's now 240 or something. Oh, my goodness. So it's right. very high. Right. So they sent me to the hospital and they did an ultrasound scan on me. And everything looked fine. I knew there was something wrong. Right. And I went down at New Year's Eve and I was interested to know what the problem was. I, I thought there was a blockage inside. Right. Uh, a lot of people have said that could well be mm. because obviously when I was eating food, there was no other symptoms at this stage. No, no, there was no. no fatigue, no nothing, or anything of that nature. No, well, there still isn't fatigue in February two thousand twenty. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I waited, and they called me in at half past two, a doctor, and I sat down, and he sat at the desk, and he said, um, "Right, well, we've managed to ascertain what the problem is to all." He said, "You've got." Um, abnormalities on your pancreas and they've spread to your liver and I said what did, did they use the word abnormalities or well, no then he went on to say uh, I, I asked him to clarify yeah. what he meant by abnormalities he said well it looks very much like cancer All right. I said percentage almost sure he said but he said we, we'll we'll do our biopsy on Monday, next Monday. Yeah. And then that was it. I got up, left. On the Monday, I went in for the biopsy, which is a minor sort of, they put a needle into your yeah. side and they, you know, they put it through into your liver and they pluck out a bit of the yeah. abnormality and they sent off to the send lab. Send it off for tests, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they, you've got to recoup for a few hours afterwards, you stay in the hospital. So I said to them in the uh, endoscopy area, I said, uh, my lift's here. Thank you very much. They said, oh, no, Mr. War, you're not allowed to leave here. We have to see the person picking you up. Right. So I said to them, right. well, I understand you being so fastidious, but isn't it strange that today you go to these lengths because I've had a mere biopsy? But last Tuesday, yeah. when I was told that I had cancer for the first time, it was just the doctor didn't he hardly looked at me. He was writing door. notes and he didn't ask me, um, how are you getting home? Are you on, do you live on your own? Mm. What, what support mechanisms surround you? Asked me nothing. So whereas on the physical side, yeah. they were almost or hugely concerned uber fast but when it came to, to the mental side the not interested. first being told you were just yeah. out of the door and at the door bye 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 10 minutes in there yeah. thank you you've got cancer life-threatening cancer yeah oh which absolutely exasperated when i look back on it now i thought wow what well, my message would be mm. to any doctor who's telling someone for the first time they've got cancer don't just tell them and then allow them to leave you. What would room. you want want them to do? What would you I'd expect a nurse do? in there to take me outside, yeah. take me into a separate room, offer me a cup of tea, say, look, is there anybody we can contact, your, your immediate family? Um, if you've got someone to come and pick you up, we don't think it's safe for you to drive. It wasn't safe for me to, to drive, actually. Right. But I did. I had no choice. Um, 
anyway, so that was that. Um, they referred me to the Royal Marsden. So I went up there, obviously a very good cancer hospital in uh, London, mm. not far from where I live, actually. And when, when they um, spoke to me there, they said, look, we presume you know why you're here. I said, yes, I do. Um, they said, and they were, they, they're doing some trials at the moment surrounding pancreatic cancer because it's an area that has def uh, defeated the medical profession for over a quarter of a century. Mm. They're no nearer now than they ever have been. This is what shocked me when you told me the news. I assumed that they can deal with all the cancers. Now, they can deal with and they can fight many cancers, but not all. No, the thing about pancreatic cancer is the first signs you have of pancreatic cancer mm. is when it's too late. Right. There aren't any symptoms. Asymptomatic up until that point. Yeah. So it's a really dangerous cancer. Thing. Really dangerous. Now, no one had ever told me. I didn't even... I'd heard pancreatic cancer. Cancer en passant. Mm. People had mentioned it to me, I suppose, over the years. I hadn't taken much notice. Mm. But I would expect something so serious to at, at least have been the public, you know, wh why aren't we told about it? What do you think, Michael, like, like a screening process, maybe? Well, or? well absolutely. I think if you, yeah. um, people should certainly, over a certain age, have regular blood tests. And when I say regular, I mean every six months. And I would say to somebody, that's not available now, mm. anybody past 55, I would advise them to have a blood test every six months and ask them, pay for it. I want this blood I give you to be analysed in yeah. all sorts of compartments yeah. to make absolutely sure that I've not, I'm not, I haven't got sort of some, some hidden um, cancer. How long do you think you've had it? Did they, did they tell you how? That was guesswork, really. They, yeah. they just don't know. I, mean, I could have had it since last summer. Right. I mean, it could, I could have, you know. And I said, have anything, is there anything that I have done that's caused it? Yeah. And they sort of pause. And one of the doctors said to me, have you had a recent trauma? And I said, yes, I have, actually. Mm. I said, two lying opportunists whom I've never met, whom I don't know, mm. um, decided to make a malicious, false allegation against me, which caused me years of anxiety and strife. Mm. Now, it, it almost drove me to the cusp of suicide. Going back to 2013 and those allegations, there's a number of concerns that came out of that situation. The length of bail time. 672 days in my case. I.e. The, the time before you actually go to court. Yeah. The fact that it was uh, in, in, a, in a Crown Court with a jury that took less than 35 minutes to arrive at well, a no guilty verdict. Well, I know. Says, is, is a bit of a worry. 35 minutes is just 35 minutes. Yeah. And... The, the reason why the jury hung around back in the retiring room was out of respect for the courts. Right. Because there was nothing to discuss. Right. It was so palpably clear there wasn't a smidgen of truth in any, any mm. of it. And then the allegations themselves weren't particularly serious. I checked to see somebody's dry in an inappropriate manner. Mm. And it was hardly the crime of the century if it had happened, which it certainly didn't. So I was put through that. Turmoil. Just to recount that situation, your house was raided. Yes, seven, both my houses. Seven in the morning. Yeah, 17, yeah. And it was two years before that case came to court. went to court. Do you put the stress and anxiety of that allegation then in one of the possible causes? Yes, I do. I don't think you can. I, we're not sufficiently well-educated about this to dismiss it 
as a possible cause. Mm. Because I think when you are extremely stressed, your body pumps all these chemicals into your body. It's the fight or flight chemicals, mm. which is what happens naturally. But of course, you're not fighting anything. Presumably, it pales into insignificance next to a cancer no, it diagnosis. Doesn't. No, it doesn't. Actually, I was in a more distressed state during those 672 days than I am now. Because the difference is, the, when you're accused of child abuse, it takes away everything that you've worked for. It strips you bare, it strips you bare emotionally. And of course, there are a lot of people who don't wait for verdicts, don't wait for the outcomes of these things. Mm. Um, you get disgusting messages sent to you online. One chap offered to pay, if I com committed suicide, he said he'd pay for my funeral to save my family having to pay. Mm. Um, those are sort of messages. Of course he wouldn't, of course, because yeah. people who send those things haven't got any money anyway. Um, so, and I was frightened when it became knowledge, when it was publicised. I was charged in mm -hmm. September 2013. Some, every time I came home, I half expected someone to put a brick through my window. Mm. It, it is awful. Now, when, you, when you're diagnosed with cancer, it's different. Everybody, but everybody, is supportive. And was that not the case with the allegation? No. Some people shun you. Mm. Some people walk away. One of my best friends I've known since I was a, a teenager. Mm. I've known him and his wife all these years. They shun me. So that will have been, without question, the worst, yeah, worse than this. period of your life, In including cancer. Yeah. I'm a, you know, I don't know how long I've got left to live. But even if I, well, I, when I die, mm. it still won't be as bad as that. And that's the message I want to get to people that when the police go after innocent people because they feel they want to prove something or other to themselves. I mean, mm. I was a casualty of Savile, but also a casualty of, he may well be now the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, who was then, 2012, the Director of Public Prosecutions, i.e. the top man in the CPS. Mm. When the, the, these two friends, or one of them, went to the police in March, April 2012, the police sent him away. It's ridiculous, I mean, what you said. Yeah. But, I mean, but when the edict came back, when the Savile scandal broke in the, in the October, I think they went back to him. According to the, the records, they then went back to, they could have done the police, mm. and then they decided they would look into it. So, but, but the, the message that Keir Starmer put through to all the police forces in the country was, if someone comes forward claiming to have been abused historically, they must be believed. Right. And that's what got me into that mess. And of course, my answer to that is, it is not the police's job to believe or disbelieve mm. either the complainant or the person, the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator. Mm. Um, they are meant to investigate thoroughly without fear or favour either side. But of course... They were totally against me from the word go. They were de absolutely determined to have me convicted for whatever reason, to help their figures, show them what a good job they were doing. Mm. I don't know why. But the, the, but the police officer in charge was utterly convinced I was guilty. She, she left, well, uh, ostensibly, she left nothing. She had no doubt. She was absolutely determined to have me charged. Found not guilty, yeah. as we said, after 30 minutes. Was it all over? No. Well, well I, th I thought it was all over in October 2014. Of course, I'm a teacher, or I was a teacher. About six weeks later, 
I had a letter from the DBS, the borrowing service. Yes. And they said they were now, they've been past the papers, and they were looking into my case, and they have a lower threshold, and they, they want to be, conv they have to convince themselves that I was innocent, mm -hmm. so they will be starting their own investigation. I thought, oh my goodness. Anyway, that went on, and in about February 2015, I had a letter from them that said, we've looked into your case, mm. we don't think there's any um, thing to answer for, and you are free to carry on working with children and vulnerable adults. And then the last line said, we will now be passing your papers on to the NCTL, the National College of Teachers and Leadership. Right. And I thought to myself, what is this now? Yeah. So we're now into what, March, April 2015. Having already been found not guilty. Yeah. And You're then still being examined. And then the DBS said and investigated. Yeah. Right. The DBS investigated and thought there's nothing to answer. Mm. And then I think it was April the first, two thousand and fifteen, I had a letter from the NCTL and they said we are looking and once again accused me of all the things mm. that I've been taken to court that they had to look into. I heard nothing from them then for about eight or nine months. I for, not forgot. I knew they were. Yeah. And then I had a letter from their solicitors saying that they were representing the NCTL TL against me. We suggest you get uh, legal representation because you will be required mm. to attend a hearing. The judge sent me a copy of what you wrote to them and said, look, you can have a copy of the summing up. But I can assure you that there was the Crown palpably failed to prove anything during the course of the trial. Um, and then I think it was July, August 2016, they finally cleared me. So, so that was, we're looking at three and a half years yeah. of my life. Many know you, of course, from various broadcasting mm. soirees. <laughs> the uh, that'll teach them, of course. You were the headmaster. They in filmed that. all day. They just didn't film in the evening. No. <laughs> <laughs> that'll teach them. Headmaster and that'll teach them. Yeah. Um, countless radio and TV appearances. Yeah. The one show. Yeah. This that, and the other. Rule and the school. I was on rule the school. school yeah. And even though one, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. you had been investigated numerous times at this point, you noticed that you were suddenly not getting calls. Yeah, I think. Well, what the, the problem being, of course, is the internet. That years ago, today's news is tomorrow's fish and chip wrapping paper. Yeah, I used to say. Now, it doesn't. I learned that actually it doesn't mean that much that you're found not guilty. Just to be accused of child abuse is enough to, for most broadcasters to run a mile. And all the work I've enjoyed subsequently mm. has been from people who knew me prior to the allegations. Right. But in terms of new work, new series... I've applied for a few things. I don't mm. even get an answer. In fact... And this is because it's still online. Well, the first thing that Someone comes up... Someone types your name in. Yeah, and it comes up. up it comes. Uh, um, cleared of child abuse. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if it's cleared. I could have been convicted. Yeah. It doesn't... For many people, they like to be on the safe side. Um, I even went... I was approached by one of the universities in London to be a judge. They'd see me on something or other asked me to be a judge on their talent show they were doing. Mm. Do you know what? They even withdrew that offer. Right. A TV company for whom I actually had done some work prior to 2013 um, approached me. One of the producers rang me up and said, oh, hello, Simon War. Yes, the sons are here. Do you remember we, you, know, you did this bit for us? Oh, yeah, I did. Look, are you still teaching? I said, well, actually, I've retired from teaching. I'm now just broadcasting. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Because on Friday, and he gave me a date, we'd like you to present this 
section of this program for camera. Would you be up for it? I said, I'd love to. Thank you very much. Yeah. And as normal in media, you get phone calls to say, you know, you've got your dietary requirements, yeah. um, travel, there'll be a car picking me up in the morning. So they got everything sorted. I need a hotel, yeah. everything sorted. On the Wednesday, two days before filming, I had a phone call to say it was cancelled. Stood down. And for the first time, obviously, mm. when they were preparing what to say about me in my uh, bi you know, biography, they put Simon War in. Right. Cleared of child abuse. And that was it. That was it. That was it, yeah. I can't prove it. What would be the highlight of your entire life, looking back? Oh, gosh. Oh, golly, go golly gosh. Mm. You've had a number, of course. You've had a lot. Yeah. But what would you say... Was the apogee, the, the acme. absolute ap the acme. acme of your of, life? Of your life, yeah. Oh dear me, that's difficult to say, really. I suppose it was in the court of law when the jury left, some of them smiling, you know, some of them weeping on my behalf, because I was upset, of course. Yeah, yeah. The relief. Oh, from my shoulders. Right. And I was told that um, by my barrister, I think the clerk, well, not the clerk of the court, the chap who escorts them in and out, mm. said they were members of the jury in floods of tears on my behalf because they could see what I'd been put through. Right. That was a special moment. That was a special moment. Oh, God. When, yeah. you, when you end up in court and you know those 12 good men and true, 12 men and women of good good men and women of of, of, um, of good character and true yeah um, they decide the future your future and yeah. uh, I suppose that was a special moment but it's a bit negative I suppose I, I suppose meeting Dawn French on the one show I loved I loved meeting Dawn French <laughs> I carried a cane round for most of the afternoon yes. we, we did the, the caning filming in the afternoon yeah and I whacked her a couple of times on the backside. She said, that's £10, that's 20 <laughs> You know, and right. she, she was a good sport. Yeah. She really was. I took to her immediately. So that was a, another highlight of my life. And of course, when they rang me up, I'd done a, a, a previous series, so that'll teach them. And when the producer rang up and offered me the job as headmaster. Yeah. That was a special That was a big uh, moment, Yeah, it right? was a big moment. Yeah. And not just an extra, not bit part, headmaster. Headmaster, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was a that was a special moment. What about Top of the Pops with the fine young cannibals? Oh, I went to Top. Do you know what? I went to Top of the Pops twice. Yeah. And on both occasions, I won best dancer in the studio. <laughs> right. I've always been a good dancer. There you go. And um, the first one was the the funnier of the two occasions because. Um, what had happened was we we at RHS Royal Hospital School mm. in eighty. Four, five. Uh, we done an all night for Ethiopia. We done an all night disco to raise money, and Top of the Pops only gave a maximum of two tickets out mm. to people visiting. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to them and said, "Look, fourteen of us did this overnight dance. Any chance of fourteen tickets?" And they sent me fourteen tickets. Did they really? Wow. So we ha we got the school minibus. We drove down, <laughs> and on the back of the ticket it said, "Top ten singles for the." best dressed person in the studio, yeah. top 10 singles for the best dancer in the studio. And they were arguing about who was going to win the best dancer. And, and the, the teacher did. <laughs> and you won it. Yeah, I won it. Yeah, that, 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 was, that was a great moment. So, oh, there have been a myriad moments yeah. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed in my life. Has it been a good life? Well, when you look back, can you say... It's had its yeah. ups and downs like any life, but, I but mean, it's been a for good the life. most part... As I mentioned earlier, mm. if you're self-sufficient, if you get on with things in the face of adversity, if you don't cry into your soup everything that goes wrong, mm. then you should be able to enjoy life, shouldn't you? And if you can laugh yeah, yeah, in the face of adversity. In the face of adversity. Or at any time, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's quite special. Is that the wisdom you'd like to impart to the next generation? Yeah, enjoy every day as it was your last, I suppose. Uh, because you never know when it's going to come to an end. Mm. Um, because if you, if you, the speed with, with which this has affected me, I mean, don't forget we're talking about a couple of months. Yeah, I th I thought I was going to live to be ninety. Yeah, we all did. Yeah, yeah. 
As Peter Cook 90 said, at least. I think Peter Cook said he would be last in the queue of employees who he thought would contract some serious illness yeah. because yeah. I've always been so full of vitality. And to think it is just bad luck. The throw know, of the dice. That's got to be galling. Yeah, and my message is just because you're fit and healthy mm. does not mean to say you don't need this, to get tested. This <laughs> cancer can come from yeah. particularly pancreatic cancer because mm. there are no warning signs. The only thing you can do is have your blood regularly tested. It is without any doubt that you have enriched the county and Radio Suffolk and you've enriched my life. Well, thank you, James. You, well, vice versa, of course. To know you for the last 10 years, the fun mm. we've had. Both on and off air. Yeah. Uh, the closest, the mm. close that mm. listen, we've established between ourselves. You know, this is a... Well, the hospitality you've shown me to invite someone, give open house, which you've given me, to your home and your family. Because mm. I know you, you're a very close family, the Hazels. Very private as yeah, well. Yeah, very private. Actually. Yeah. And yet you've thrown your doors open to me and said, come and stay whenever you want. And you said that to me years ago. Mm. I thought, what a generous thing to say. Mm. I don't say it to everybody. <laughs> no. And, and I'm not an easy guest because I'm loud or was yeah. very loud and I interrupt yeah. everything. But good fun. You can't, you can't, you can't even watch a TV program. No, it's without... like a hurricane. <laughs> it, it literally, it, yeah, it's a hurricane when Simon comes. It's like when you have a toddler around. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's... <laughs> It was immense fun, yeah. and I will miss those evenings yeah. greatly. Um, so I thank you, thank you for being part of my life. Thank you.